It's a situation that affects so many of us, yet is still so unique. And no matter how much we try to navigate it, we can never seem to find the right path. Home studio vocal recording is a very real problem that affects more of us than we care to admit. It's difficult, stressful, and at times, depressing. Fortunately, there's a solution. The home studio is an increasingly common environment in today's industry. My name is Mike from Ruling Note Music, and this video is going to help you take control of the quality of your vocal home recordings. Stick around. Home studio vocal recording is a necessary evil. You're most likely doing it for two reasons. Either you're ready to move on to recording vocals after you wrote your perfect song, or you want to start a career in voiceover. These circumstances, although very different in the respective end products, are similar in preparation. And if you're as lost as I was when I first started recording, or you're trying to piece together something effective on the cheap, it may help to go over a few things. Keep in mind, this is a lot of information, and if this is your first time watching this video, I recommend watching all the way through. But for those revisiting or looking for something more specific, I've split this video into five subjects to tackle, and the timestamps for each of these sections are in the video description. Also, to get this out of the way, I'm gonna say now that the prices of gear I recommend are as of this recording. And just as well, I am not currently endorsed by any of the companies or products I am mentioning. Nobody is paying me to say this, I just like these products and the job they do. So, let's get into it. Step one your microphone. There are a lot of microphones out there and each type is very different, but there are two things you should worry about starting out. One is the pickup pattern, two is the type of mic you're using. Let's get the first one out of the way, pickup pattern. There are many types, but for the sake of simplicity, cardioid microphones are the ones to shoot for. These mics pick up best from right in front. There are other patterns, but they're mostly made for other situations. As far as voice goes, cardioid is pretty much what you should look for. Now the type of mic. There are two mics most people use for voice, and they have their ups and downs. You have condenser mics and dynamic mics. Condenser mics tend to be most recommended from the get-go. A decent home studio condenser normally goes for a price between $200 to $1,200. You'll hear a lot about these in forums and from local music shops. One of my favorite condensers for home voiceover is the Neumann TLM-103. And in the lower price range, if you know what to do with it, the TechZone Stellar X2 is an amazing mic. And I personally recommend using condensers but only if you have a room or vocal booth conditioned for it. See, the issue is that condensers are extremely sensitive. The cheaper ones rumble easy and may only come with a hard clip instead of a shock mount. This sucks to find out the hard way. If you pick one of these up, make sure that it at least features a low cut filter and a shock mount to help you get rid of potential low end rumble issues. You can also buy shock mounts separately. Just make sure they fit your mic. The sweet spot for most condenser mics is a short distance away between six and 10 inches. This is great if you're looking for sound quality, but horrible if you're recording in a loud environment like an untreated bedroom. Condensers hear everything. This includes your voice bouncing off the walls or your roommate watching TV in the other room. Trust me, it shows in your files when you start mixing. For most bedroom beginners, I recommend dynamic mics. A good universal one like the Shure SM57 or 58 starts at about 100 bucks anywhere you go. These mics are built for stage and studio and do a lot of the job for you. They're self-shock mounted and pretty easy to work with and just about every engineer will know what to do with it. As far as other vocal dynamic mics in this price range, they tend to be modeled after these, but best fit on stage. The drawback in this price range is that the high-end sibilance sounds a bit sharp, but this can be handled with a little EQ or de-essing. And to prove it, I'm tracking this entire video with the 57 to show you can get a decent sound out of it. There are some higher budget dynamic mics as well. The Shure SM7B and Electrovoice RE20 are fantastic for voiceover and have a great natural radio sound. However, their output is really low and you'll need to pick up a cloud lifter to boost the levels enough to work with a home studio interface. One quick side note. In regards to professional vocals, I personally recommend to stay away from USB mics in general for pro voiceover. USB mics are just fine for cutting demos, especially if you're starting small, and we've all been there. The issue here is that they combine too many features at too low a price to be professionally effective in most cases. These mics are jack of all trades, master of none to a T. Other things to pick up in regards to a mic would be a pop filter, a windscreen, a cable. Get good cables, the good ones. This is important, and a vocal shield to start, but more on that in the next segment. Now, after you've made the choice of a mic and a good cable, it's time to move on. Step two, your interface and DAW. There are a ton of options when it comes to interfaces and recording software. The average cost for most basic one or two channel interfaces tends to start at 100 to 150 bucks or so, depending on features. And before you comment, yes, I've seen many options below this range, but I tend to find that if it talks a big game and costs next to nothing, it's broken, buggy, has terrible customer support, I could go on all day. 
So unless you're good with programming and or a soldering iron, you're most likely wasting your money. Pretty much if it sounds too good to be true, it is. This is another reason why I consider USB mics to be a bad idea. You can get a decent interface for pretty cheap these days and some come with good software. Personally, I'm a sucker for Personas for this reason. Even their cheaper interfaces sound great. The lowest one is about a hundred bucks and records a high quality. Their software is fantastic for the price and their customer support is awesome, especially if you register your hardware. I'm a Studio One user and most people I run into only need the hundred dollar version, which comes free with their interfaces, even the hundred dollar ones. I will take a short second to say I don't discount other programs at all. If Ableton or Pro Tools or Reaper is right for you, go for it. Studio One tends to be my personal preference due to how easy it is to navigate for me but there is no such thing as a wrong choice for a DAW. It just comes down to what you choose to use. Step three, your environment. This is the most nerve wracking part of recording vocals at home. Nobody thinks about this until they cut their first track. And then when you research it, everyone's an expert and looking for clear advice is a nightmare. It will make your head spin. I'll try to help narrow it down to three practical options. You could build a booth, use a walk-in bedroom or a closet, or convert a corner of your room. Now, before you decide, keep this in mind. Do what you can to eliminate noise in your environment. This means fans, regular house AC, etc. The computer I'm tracking with is like 20 feet away right now. Look at any pro studio footage from your favorite artist. The mics, whether in the live room or the vocal booth, are as isolated from the equipment as possible. Do what you can to achieve something similar with your recording equipment. And if that's not possible, don't worry. If you can, get as far away as plausible and try to aim the back of the mic toward the more noisy equipment. This may take some rearranging of your environment and it won't solve everything, but it's a step in the right direction. Option one, build a booth. There are many ways to do this and people go a little crazy with it, but the best thing you can do is create a treated, enclosed area with uneven, mostly soft surfaces. Some people literally build a booth with two by fours and plywood in the recording room and treat the inside with studio foam. This totally works, but if you're on a tighter budget, you can try building a frame with PVC pipe and use moving blankets as a baffle or combine these ideas. One thing to note is to try to cover hard surfaces to help deaden the sound near the mic. Important side note. Be careful about your foam choice. Make sure the foam you buy is treated with flame retardant spray. Most professionally made foam is treated and manufacturers mention this about their product. Do your research before you buy. Option two, closets. The idea of using an empty closet, walk-in or otherwise, is the same as the booth. Treat the walls and the ceiling. Soft, uneven foam surfaces work best at absorbing reflections and help you get that isolated sound. Also, if you're in a pinch, and I was at one time, it doesn't hurt to try tracking near an open bedroom closet with the mic aimed at the hanging clothes inside and away from the rest of the room. These clothes create an uneven surface and help deaden the rest of the room, so give it a try. Option three, convert a corner. So, what if you don't have a spare closet or the landlord won't let you build a booth? The next thing to try is to clear out a corner of the room. This is somewhat similar to the PVC pipe booth idea. You stand in the corner, facing the rest of the room, and you aim the mic at you. Treat the area behind you and use a shield behind the mic to isolate it from the rest of the room. Now these pictures are a good example for recording music, but for voiceover I might try adding some moving blankets to the sides and the top to help cut out any possible extra reflections. In the interest of full disclosure, at the moment I'm in a closet type area in a room that's been built inside my garage, lined with ugly ass used carpet squares. And on one side of it, I've hung a moving blanket. If you have the room and the time, a horrendous looking effective vocal booth can be yours. One more thing, track with hardwired closed back headphones. Not Bluetooth Beats, not sound canceling $20 Sony cans you bought at Walmart. Hell, if you want to track with Sony's, use these guys. The MDR7506 closed back headphones. They go for about a hundred bucks and sound fantastic. If you're more budget conscious, Audio-Technica ATH M20 headphones go for 50 bucks. Step four, be honest with your engineer. I've happened to run into a few people that have been a bit nervous about some of the gear they use. And yeah, your setup may not be a top-end studio that costs stupid money to get into, but so what? That's not a reason to sell yourself short. I'm a guitar player, so I'll paraphrase a quote that I read in a guitar magazine back in the day. Eddie Van Halen is still Eddie Van Halen, even if he's playing through a shoebox. And just as valid, Tara Strong and Joe DiMaggio still sound like they do, even if you put them in front of a 57. Don't know who they are? Yeah, you do. Google them. This brings us to our next step, honesty. I'm gonna be open about my opinion of the direction of the recording industry. A lot of people in the industry right now are forced to work from home. This means some compromises will have to be taken in regards to industry preference, but this can also be a way to put the ball in your hands. The option to be picky about whether or not you as the talent are using a $4,000 mic is fading fast. The most recent rising pop star, Billie Eilish at 17 years old, just recorded her entire debut album in her childhood bedroom with a $1,000 microphone. She swept the Grammys with it. As a matter of fact, home recorded music and voiceover jobs have been on the rise for years. This is your time. Take hold of this opportunity now. 
So if you're working with an engineer, tell them what you use. Everything, the mic, the interface, the environment, the cables, all of it. Take pictures. They can look up the specs on the gear. This helps them to prepare for the mixing job coming for them. The worst jobs I've ever dealt with as an engineer are the ones where I flew in blind without knowing the recording situation, or even worse, if the talent lied to me about what they used. It's not impossible to mix, but it's frustrating and it's happened to me. Don't do this. And with that, we move on to the final segment. Step five, self-mixing. All right, you got your studio together, built or pieced together a vocal booth and did your takes. Now what? Now some of you may have an engineer or producer you send tracks to. Others may not need a finished product. Some of you, especially in the voiceover community, may be working directly with the client that is paying for a finished vocal track. This section will introduce you to a couple techniques and plugins that'll help you get one step closer to a fully finished product. Part one, dynamics control. Now, this is the million dollar question. How much compression do I use? The answer is not too much and not too little. Confused? Good, I've done my job then. Here's the deal. Dynamics in general is touchy. There are two major sides to it, and compression is only one side of it. The other side is called expansion, more commonly known by its extreme term, gating. Here's the breakdown. Compression is a tool used to control two things, the changing volume level of a performance and the overall tone of that performance. It does this by crushing the track at the ratio you set once it hits a certain volume. The vocal track is a slew of constantly changing factors. There's the pitch of the vocal, the tone of the mouth as it forms vowels, the sibilance of the air moving through your teeth, the volume of a calm monologue, a horrified shriek, or the belly laugh of a giant. If you overcompress, you slam all of that performance into the concrete and kill the experience, throwing it into an uncanny valley akin to Superman's CGI removed mustache. This is a part of audio engineering that requires more depth that I will visit in another video. There is a lot of math involved. If you overdo it, you can really mess up your overall tone. However, this doesn't mean don't try using it at all. For now, the best thing I can recommend with standalone compression plugins is to start light. Check out a couple of factory presets first, especially in the mix. Play around with it. Or if you're uncomfortable with it, skip it for now. Let's move on to the other portion, gating. Now I can get more technical here. As far as I'm concerned, I like to avoid gating in vocals wherever possible. It's just as touchy as compression, but in the opposite direction. When the volume of your track drops below the threshold, the gate engages, muting the signal. The problem here is that the gate doesn't engage until just after the volume goes above it, resulting in a harsh cutoff of the beginning of your words in most sentences. This is fine for hard hits like drums, but not great for softer starting sounds like vocals. Some people try using gates to eliminate some line or room noise in the vocal track. It happens to the best of us. The problem here is as soon as you start speaking, the noise shows up too. And that brings me to my first plugin recommendation. Part two, good vocal plugins. There are a couple plugins by a company called Isotope that I always tend to gravitate to in my mixes, and they make some amazing pro-grade plugin suites, but they also have great, affordable, budget-level versions that take out a lot of guesswork. For line and room noise issues that may show up after tracking, try using Isotope RX Elements. As of this recording, it goes for $129 and is a steal. It can handle clipping issues, pops, clicks, and most importantly for this video, it has a fantastic denoiser plugin that reads the noise profile of your track and removes it rather than a gate. This is much more natural sounding and can save your performance. If you're interested, they do have a more costly standard and pro level version as well. And you can upgrade from elements when you have the funds available. The next plugin I recommend is Isotope Nectar, which is a vocal processing suite. This includes everything most people are looking for in a single plugin. Compression, EQ, de reverb, delay, etc. The version I own is Nectar 2, which is no longer available, but I have found that Nectar Elements at $29 is a fantastic plugin for home vocal production for music or voiceover. The new pro version, Nectar 3, currently goes for $249 and is also available as an upgrade from Elements at a discounted rate. So that's it for now. Thanks for checking out my video. Quick shout out to Nico Panagopoulos for his fantastic voiceover for the opening sketch. Please swing by his website and follow him on Facebook and Instagram. Links in the description for his incredible photography work and feel free to check out my other videos as well. I'll have more coming soon. Thank you for watching the video. Side effects may include clicking the like button, commenting, subscribing, or clicking the bell icon for more updates. Ask your sound engineer if your home vocal booth is right for you. Again, this is Mike from Ruling Note Music reminding you to never compromise your sound.